I am Lourdes Perez, and I'm Dr. Annette Darmada, and this is the Vox Fem Network. Today, we are thrilled and honored and overjoyed to have with us Maysoon Zayed. She's a comedian, an actress, a writer, and a disability advocate. She is a graduate of Arizona State University and a Princeton Fellow. Maysoon is the co-founder, co-executive producer of the New York Arab American Comedy Festival and the Muslim Funny Fest. Her TED Talk, I Got 99 Problems, Palsy is Just One, has been translated into 42 languages and was one of the most popular talks of 2014. And we had a lot to do with that because we saw it at least a thousand times. <laughs> as a professional <laughs> comedian, as a professional comedian, we because we can can. As a professional comedian, May soon has sold out top New York City clubs and has toured extensively at home and abroad. She was a headliner on the Arabs Gone Wild comedy tour and the Together Live tour. May soon has appeared alongside. Adam Sandler in You Don't Mess with Zohan, and is a recurring character on General Hospital. Maysoon has limped in the New York Fashion Week, tap dance on Broadway, and is an ambassador for Huda Beauty. She's the author of the best-selling memoir, Find Another Dream. Shiny Misfits is her debut graphic novel. Learn more at maysoon.com. Ahlan wa sahlan ya Maysoon. You read my whole bio. That was hilarious. <laughs> that it, we want we want it all in there. Why why leave any of it out? I'm like, let her have at it. They want to do it. They get to do it. So yeah. where do we begin? What do we talk about? Yeah, today? let's let's get let's get right into this. So I the very first thing that we have to say We're going today, straight into genocide. I, you know, we just want to say that the that the time of this taping, right? This is August nineteenth. Um, there's something just distinctly not funny happening, and that that there's an accelerated genocide of Palestinians as we're sitting here speaking, and um, it's an annihilation in Gaza, a, a, a gruesome, relentless campaign by Israel with U.S. funding and support taking place. And we say accelerated because torturing and massacring Palestinians didn't begin on October 7th. Um, we heard you speak, Maysoon, years ago about your belief um, that the path to equal rights for everyone um, begins with one secular state solution. Um, one of the things we love about you, besides the fact that you're just hilarious, is that you know you also use your platform to speak of equal rights for everyone you're very clear about that and so i just want to open up in that context this is where we are at the moment i want to give your audience a little bit of context i'm a stand-up comedian who can't stand up and i often joke on stage that in the oppression olympics i would win a gold medal because i'm palestinian i'm muslim i'm disabled so I have cerebral palsy, which is my visible disability, but I'm also neurodivergent. I'm also divorced, okay? That's a new one. <laughs> I think it's a new one. Yay, go me. Um, um, but I'm also living in Joe Biden's America. And it's, it's very surreal for me because my family, my loved ones, every kid in my life, they all live in Palestine. And... What's happening in Gaza is like a constant horror movie that we're watching live stream, but people don't realize what's happening in the West Bank. And so like my family's in Dehesha refugee camp and like they're in mortal danger every day. The rest of my family is in this like really calm, posh, cute village outside of Ramallah and they're in mortal danger every day. And my friends who are in Jerusalem are in mortal danger every day. And I often think it's like, what came first, do you know, the chicken or the egg? Did I start loving equality, fighting for equality, truly believing in equality because I grew up as a Palestinian who always witnessed supremacy firsthand and was like, why are these people given rights and these people not given rights? What's the difference between them? They were born a different faith with no control over it out in this land. Or is it because of my cerebral palsy and being disabled? So I do a joke on stage about, I call the disability community the disco, disco, the first, you know, letters. And I always say, 
you can join the disco at any time, whether you want to or not. Disability does not discriminate. It doesn't care what race you are. It doesn't care what religion you are, what age you are, what economic class you are, what gender you are, or who you love. And I think we should all be more like disability. So because the disability community intersected with so many other communities, I was exposed to diversity and it, and that want and desire for equality at a really young age. But I also literally grew up spending my summers in Palestine. My parents would send us to live in a war zone because it was like your grandma and grandpa lived there, school's out. We definitely can't afford daycare. You getting on a plane and going to Palestine. And we we're like, hey, Palestine, let's go. You know? And so I dedicated my career to kind of educating people on, on the fact that like Palestinians are a people. We're an indigenous people. Like my grandparents were Palestinian, my parents were Palestinian. We don't want to live on, you know, the occupied land of the Lenny Lenape and Ramapo, New Jersey. We want to go back to Palestine. We are nonviolent. We do believe in what Mandela fought for. And I felt like such a failure this year because I felt like everything I had ever done had completely failed to humanize my people, to get people to understand that like genocide is not a single issue when you're a voter. Genocide is an all encompassing issue. And it starts with, if they come for them, they will come for you. And yes. you need to really pay attention to where power is, where weapons are and what power remains with the people and what gets normalized because if it gets normalized in gaza it's going to get normalized for you if that because that it kind of normalized in the american schools when we accepted kindergarten students being honestly you know shot to pieces in exactly. uvalde and in sandy hook and in uvalde when the police stood outside and we said how do you stand outside while children are slaughtered. Now I say, how do you watch the internet while children are slaughtered? How am I still having a conversation that no child, regardless of faith, should be murdered? And if you believe that children being murdered makes you safer, you have to stop, sit, figure out what that fear is and dis spell it, dismiss it immediately because the murder and massacre of children makes no one safer. And then we'll switch to comedy, I promise you. But I also just want to say shout out to Palestinian men because they're not disposable either. Exactly. 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 The idea that every man and boy that that dies in Palestine it is not counted, is not mourned, is an acceptable acceptable collateral damage or even worse vilified just because of their gender is inhumane and i think of my dad and i think if my dad was there protecting his four daughters doing his best to use his body to shield us from rubble and bombing and he would not be counted he would be vilified it's 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 grotesque to me and mm -hmm. and when you study the history of other genocides and other brutal, brutal civil wars, when the when the killing fields stopped, vengeance wasn't on people's mind. Life was, living was, moving forward was. So for people who were like, okay, but with everything that happened, how do you bounce back from the, that? You give them all a chance, excuse me, I'm doing a TV show now. Want to show your face so that they see? Yeah. You're there, hold on. Right. Hold on. Because somebody's being really bad right now. Is this yeah. your cat? Yeah. <laughs> Come and show your face and tell them. Oh, oh my God. That you're Hi, beautiful. Hi. Did you imagine the kills? And then oh. you, I'm not going to stop the interview. And why oh. are you not looking at them? 
we don't stop interviews when cat we we, we may love we cats. might just all just be about the cat tell them that you were scratching the furniture because you thought i wouldn't go get you and put you on this radio show say hi to everyone can you take a screenshot of us yes, yes. of course like yes, all of us the four of us together all four of us four of us oh my god you got it let's see oh my oh. god oh what is this that's beautiful that's creature's name that Shakira and Beyonce won't let me catch her, but she'll come back eventually. <laughs> ah, anyway, so <laughs> for the Beyonce didn't I got... like the green room provisions; they weren't sufficient. <laughs> yeah, Beyonce was like, "I don't remember anyone paying me for me to make an appearance." Yours, <laughs> like my hips don't lie. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, you know, I know this is Vox Fem, but I just, I want to also say about Palestinian men and, and, and boys that, and I, because I think it's important to come from us in particular, because feminists right now, we have a lot of disappointments going on. So I, I want to oh, say this. Yeah. I think the, the, a lot of the footage that has been so horrible, but also the tenderness, the the amazing love that has been shown just with the thousands upon thousands of videos of Palestinian men um, yeah. just caring for their families and looking for their families and caring for each other. That can't be unseen ever. I think that it's they're so interesting also in caring for their sisters and caring for their wives. Yes. Like, it was like full circle. It wasn't just daughters and mothers. It was like this, this real sensitivity for their wives their sisters their yes you know their female colleagues yes yes yes, yes. so it really demolishes that narrative i yes, think um, yeah if we i think so i think so but also i think that us constantly saying women and children yeah 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 we have but to for me, if you have to just say children like if we have to kill the adults kill the adults it's fine but please yeah, yeah. please yeah. Yeah. So at this point, I want you all to go back to like the battlefields and get the kids out. And then like exactly. whoever wants to go and like battle on the field. And like let's just be real like very clear about what I'm saying right now. What's happening is a genocide, not a war. Okay. Yes. And exactly. uh, there's a there's a people being decimated. There are families being wiped off the registry. But yes. I'm saying in general. For war worldwide, I want everyone to leave children out and get back on the battlefields and like kill each other. If you really can't stop, then do it like the Olympics, like have a judo fighter, you take all the land, whatever. But I need you to stop mass disabling children. Yes. Because between life and death is disability. And while I am a loud, proud disco member and disability advocate, I am not a silly clown that thinks we should cause disability. Yes. Right. There's no, no pride in mass disabling children no. and having education at, that they're going to have to deal with for a lifetime that yes. are currently healing in a non-septic situation. So like my brain is constantly just in this chaotic motion of like women are giving birth in the most hideous conditions, which means cerebral palsy, the yes. neurological disability that I have is going to increase. I'm hearing and reading and it's documented that polio. Polio, the first case, well, yeah. They come back like as if it's 90s fashion. Which and, was great. and that will affect but, children. That will affect ch children, uh, you know. For their entire life. Yes. For their entire life. Yes. Like polio, we looked at the older generation, they were like, oh, yeah, they had polio. Like someone, you know, that's like Mitch McConnell's age. And now we're reintroducing polio. And also, like, I, uh, I come from farm people. So like my people in Palestine are from a village called Deir de Buen, and we grow olives and fruit and grapes and lemons. And my house has like all these plants and I, I'm a farmer. And what they've done to the land in Gaza, mm -hmm. the land in Gaza is decimated. It's decimated. Like decimated. 
I yeah. mean, what is this all for? Natural gas, lands, canals, natural resources. This has nothing to do with security. This has nothing to do with religion. It all has to do with the fact that Gaza is sitting on a huge gas reserve. And, yes. and you know, having access to Gaza's waterway and kind of building a little canal, it will transform world trade. And the idea that indigenous people are disposable yes. is being tested right now. It's being yeah. tested right now. We yes. always say like, okay, look at what happened to the indigenous population in America, but now at Standing Rock, we'll go stand with them. Or we say, how could the Holocaust have happened? I wouldn't have let it happen. And I'm proud to say I wouldn't have let it happen because I've lost everything. I've yeah. lost my livelihood. I've lost my friends. I've lost my sense of safety. Like you said, I lost my allies. I lost my really cool government connections that I honestly needed as a disabled woman trying to survive America. Uh, but I, I would have done it. But how many people would look at those images and say, not my business? Right. Yeah. When we talk about turning away refugees and we say, we would have we would have helped them. We would have saved them. We would have sheltered them. We would have never let this happen. No, you would because you're watching it happen right now. Yes. Yeah. yes. And we're getting yelled at for being party poopers because we won't stop talking about the daily massacre. And such a party pooper. Such such a party pooper that, party is, pooper. that you won't compromise right. on, you know, oh, like on the death of, of, of thousands of thousands people. and thousands. And this is the thing is that what we aim to do as, as human beings, beings with a conscience is to rec recognize a historic moment and stay, step into it. And what we are seeing is the silence, the quiet, the people like turning themselves into a pretzel to kind of to, to, to say, oh, well, but we need to do this or lesser of evils. And it's just such a, uh, just a disconnect and a, mm -hmm. not just a disconnect, it's also the bullying of, of the people who are standing against genocide. And that's one of the questions that some of the people in the audience were sending you is like, how do you, uh, what do you tell uh, young people, children, and adults, for that fact, um, how to to deal with this barrage of of bulliness and ridicule that we are subjected to for just standing for other human beings across the sea? So, it's a very very old tactic to pit minority communities against each other, right? right? Like in the disability community, 48% of the community voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And we were like, what are you doing? The road to universal health care is through Clinton. Zionist monster aside, the road to health care was, was through Clinton. And what we heard from disabled people were white, older disabled people believed that brown disabled people were illegally getting health care and black disabled people were faking it to get health care and that their health care costs were high because of the bad minorities that were stealing health care and faking disabilities. That's how we pit minorities against each other. And right now they're trying extraordinarily hard to pit the black community against mm -hmm. the Indian community and say that we're standing in the way of Kamala Harris winning the election and blocking the supremacist Donald Trump. And what we're saying is Kamala Harris, and I, I pray to God I'm saying it right, so I'll just say VP Harris, because I don't intend to mispronounce. I have cerebral palsy and my tongue is heavy, so I'll say VP Harris. VP Harris is second in command of the administration that is providing arms to commit the genocide, providing funding to commit the genocide, providing vetoes to commit this genocide. I personally blame no one more, no one more than Joe Biden. So mm -hmm. when we protest and when we start the conversation with VP Harris saying we need an arms embargo now because what's yeah. 
the killing is an arms embargo. And I know people are like, you were screaming ceasefire now, now you're screaming arms embargo. Ceasefire now, we need a ceasefire. We need the fog of war to stop. We need to see what was happening. But now we know that a ceasefire is used to re and re up ammunition and weapons and to come back and kill more faster. So we need an arms embargo so that you can figure out how to stop the killing. Again, full circle. No one is safer because Palestinians are being massacred. We are all so much more unsafe. We are all more unsafe. And I spent like time just being like, Zionism is not Judaism. Please do not attack the Jewish Absolutely. community. Please do not lean into anti-Semitic stereotypes. But also, uh, I don't know what's happening with people being surprised that the United States was okay with prisoners being raped to death as a form of torture. We committed Abu Ghraib. Abu Ghraib, exactly. So we normalized those pictures. We forgave those soldiers. They probably get a pension or something. I don't know that. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, we did Abu Ghraib. Why would you all think that we would condemn? And when I say we, I take no ownership of the United States of America. You know, I'm Palestinian and I'm happy to go home if anyone would legally allow I'm Puerto me to leave. <laughs> <laughs> go. You're Puerto Rican. So of course you're voting for Donald Trump because he gave you free towels. <laughs> for the paper, he threw it. She's in it for the paper uh, towels. For the paper I, towels. I feel like we need to have one of those like healing conferences where it's like Guam, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and Palestine just being like, can we stop being colonies, please? <laughs> can, can you guys we stop? You're really bad at this. And like, we'll give you a discount on our beachfront resorts. But could you stop <laughs> passing weapons on us? It's really getting old. Yes. Yes. I want to just say one more thing off of what you were saying about the ceasefire and the, uh, versus arms embargo, because I think it's it's really important. I think that for most people, the you know the initial reaction is ceasefire, like stop firing, right? And so now you finally, after what eleven months, you hear little tiny echoes. The Democrats are trying to. Some people are trying to say, yeah, we definitely need a ceasefire. But they're starting to say ceasefire while sending the actual weapons. You can't say that and send you. You talked about school shootings, and you know we we operated in Texas for when when Uvalde happened, and it's like it would be like saying there's a school shooter in there, and it's like yeah, he really needs to stop. And then in the meantime, you're just supplying him the ammunition to continue right. for weeks, Imagine. months, years. I don't know. We back to art and back to art and failure. Um, we <laughs> this year we have you know we've been in it for a long time 30, 30 years in music and arts and we we had all this and, and social justice and we had all this ideas that we were making some you know so putting much. seeds out there and all that and we said the same thing you did what a failure we've been saying this we've been saying this I'm what like, a failure I'm to pack up my guitar and go and we've been saying what a failure and and yet here we are, right? Well, obviously we still believe in it because you're here today, we're here today. Right. We still believe that we can, there's a path forward, right? We still believe we can make some kind of sense and change, right? We're doing it and we're doing yeah. it. Like, so I'm working on a movie right now in yes. Palestine and my crew is all women and the movie is called Mejdaline. And I decided to have an all woman crew because we have 74% high school graduation rate among women in Palestine and 17.2% employment rate. And this is a statistic actually in the West Bank. And so I was like, let me have an all woman crew. And when I look around at the art that's being made right now, it is just stunning. Starting off with the fact that there was this thing online, and I always say online is Star Wars, right? There's a dark side and light side, and this was in light, where indigenous people worldwide were doing their own indigenous dances. And these like young hip TikTok people started putting like 
Palestinian dance, over like Icelandic indigenous dance, yes. over Puerto Rican indigenous dance, over uh, Australian indigenous dance, over African indigenous dance. And they were all doing the same thing, which was stomping their feet. Whether it was to move the ground, whether it was to resist, they had that same heartbeat, that same motion. And I was like, wow. That's beautiful. We're all so incredibly connected. Yes. And another thing about Palestine that, that echoes other, other horrific genocides is this isn't about race. And I get very annoyed when people say they're killing them because they're brown. Palestinians are not brown. Palestinians have all skin tones. My mom is like porcelain white. We joked that she was left over from the Crusades. My dad looked more African. There are Palestinians who are black. There are Palestinians who like me are like, you know, amber gold. We are the entire array of skin tone. So this is about supremacy. This is about colonization. I always say this is like, the classic American colony. We go, we take their resources, we give them McDonald's and we're like, you were too stupid to save yourself. So here we are. Yeah, we're gonna save you here. The arts are thriving. And there's this great uh, quote that I brought for you all. And again, I apologize, I'm very bad at names, but there's a woman named Tony Cumbrea. And the quote is, it's the artist's job to make the revolution irresistible. You can't quit. I say to people all the time, it is disconnecting to do comedy in a time of genocide. It's it's a, like I remember getting off stage, and I've been I've been advocating for Palestine and disability and ending violence against women my whole life. So my comedy has always been used as a platform but you know i remember getting off stage and being like i'm gonna go on the treadmill i'm gonna go dance or i'm gonna do something and now i get off stage and i just scroll through genocide and i check to see if my family's alive i check to see if my apartment is still mine or or if it's been taken because my the only home i own is in Palestine, <laughs> and you know it, 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 the idea of getting on stage and being like yuck yuck funny and then getting off stage and just shaking and being like please god let me go home and see the people i love please let me survive please let them you know be there in the morning it's it's so it's 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 impossible to not lose your mind so leaning into my art is what keeps me grounded and keeps me sane and gives me the ability to go forward because I'm like, okay, okay, what can I do? What I can do is create, motivate, educate. How you got to your art is a very yes. beautiful story. Um, so we want to we want to ask you about that. Um, we have seen uh, clips of you dance tap dancing and then from cerebral palsy to tap dancing on Broadway. <laughs> How did you get there? How did From you get there? tap dancing, it's a great immigrant story. My parents were young immigrants when they had me. They couldn't afford physical therapy. I don't know the exact, I know the dance class exact cost, but I don't know the exact number, but it was something like physical therapy was $25 an hour. Dance class was $5 a week. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yes. So, Instead of sending me a physical therapy, they sent me a dance class. Instead of occupational therapy, I had a piano teacher, and she was $7 an hour. And that's how I, I trained my little hands. They're not great. I can't cook or type, but I love to dance, so my, my legs are pretty strong. So that, that was my physical therapy. So this is very important. I grew up without social media, and, and my parents sent me for solo classes so that the teacher could work with me specifically and I could, you know, get better. It mattered. So at the end of the year, I always got to do a solo performance and I always had a standing ovation and people were crying. And I thought it was because I was Beyonce talented. 
And what was actually happening was I was the inspirational disabled girl. But because there was no internet, no one ever made a video of me that went viral so that I would know that they thought I was inspirational. And people were crying about how happy they were that they weren't me and how inspired they were because they would kill themselves if they were me, which is something people tell me to my face. I just thought I was super talented. And so I kind of went through life being like, I live in New Jersey, across the river is Broadway. I want to dance on Broadway. Like, what else do you want to do in your life? And that's how Find Another Dream, my memoir got its name. Because I was 12 years old, I was at a dance educators conference, and they had these Broadway divas teach us a number, and then go around the circle and ask us what our dream was. And the girl right before me, we 12, said she wanted to be a unicorn. And the Broadway diva was like, you go girl. And then I said, I wanted to tap dance with Savion Glover and bring in the noise, bring in the funk on Broadway. And she said, girl, you're a cripple, find another dream. And so I did, and my dream was to be on General Hospital. And so then 20 years later, I tap danced on Broadway. And 20 years after I started my comedy career, I was cast on General Hospital. So yeah. the whole gist of find another dream is, yeah, it's fine. I found another dream, but I never gave up that dream. You don't get to be a stranger who comes into my life to define me and tell me what I can and can't do. But at the same time, we need to be realistic with ourselves. I... I'm not going to become a cardiac surgeon. It doesn't matter how many times I say can, can, can. My dad's mantra was you can do it. Yes, you can, can. I can't, can, can cardiac surgery. <laughs> I don't have the time to study it. I'm, I don't have the coordination. It's not going to happen. It's also very important to be realistic with yourself and be like, okay, if my dream turns into a nightmare, I can find another dream. Or it's great to dream, but let's live in reality, you know, right now. During a genocide, I get super annoyed by people talking about their own self-care. Because I'm like, oh my gosh, you have so much privilege. The woman with, you know, two jobs and three kids doesn't get to be like, and then I just was like, you know what? I'm turning off my phone. No, you, you don't get to turn off your phone. This one has the flu. That one forgot that you know they had to bring in the lice check. I don't know what's happening, but kids are a lot. And when you have a job and you have kids and you can't make ends meet and suddenly you have you know some sort of health issue, self-care is not part of that circle. So it's like, okay, I have to keep reminding myself that those of us who care for others and do have the privilege of caring for ourselves have to do the airplane thing where it's like you save yourself first so that you can save as many other people. But also I want privileged people to stop being like, listen, I know that you're all being killed, but I want to save everyone here. So I'm just going to ignore that. And then as soon as I save everyone here, I'll come back to the people who are being killed. I'm like, your hypothetical nightmare is more important than the horror film I'm living in right now. Right now. So exactly. what could happen, what could happen tomorrow is more important than what's happening right now, today, online in screenshots. Beyonce heard a reference to her. And she's <laughs> <laughs> you will show your face Beyonce oh my you're God. Back. back cameo cameo hold on more hold cameos on. more cameos <laughs> you have beautiful eyes Beyonce <laughs> I hope she can't hear me no yeah. we we're crazy cat ladies too we're crazy cat ladies against genocide however Yes, that's who we are. And we we can push uh VP Harris to at least lie about being anti-genocide to get her votes. <laughs> that yeah. was yeah. like the real test in the beginning. We were just like, listen to us, just lie about it. That's what politicians do. Yeah. But just being like, it's okay, just keep killing them. It kind of makes me 
concerned. Yeah, I'm very, very concerned. concerned. You know, but I mean, it's way better than Joe Biden because I could never in my life ever, ever vote for Joe Biden. Never in my life. I'm not going to save you from a tyrant, Trump. Go save yourselves because if you're not saving my people, I'm not going to save you. Like, mm -hmm. it's not transactional, but I'm not voting for the guy who killed 14,000 kids at least. Yeah. VP Harris has room. She has room to move. Yeah. She has be revolutionary she has room to like fulfill that cliche that we're always saying if women ruled the world well here's your chance woman rule the world rule the world and say i'm not gonna allow kids to be amputated anymore uh, violently amputated obviously yeah. for health yeah we no. keep saying genocide is not a feminist value it is not a feminist it's value and that's the thing is that you cannot just um, just get behind somebody because she's a woman. You have to have some demands about what is going to happen, so that you you give this you give the room and the space, but you also put pressure, make demands. I think that this that feminist was what the whole voting cycle was for. If you want to get our vote, you have to listen to our demands and show us policy that will address those demands. Exactly. It's not our job to be Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders for you. Yeah. It's That's not our job. Our job is to put demands. I what? Like Say I'm that again. Really high. I feel like I could. <laughs> I, I think I you can could. understand what you're saying, but I feel like I could be a Dallas Cowboy cheerleader. <laughs> And I'm neurodivergent, so that was the only thing I could. I, I understand. It's not. You're right. It was like an audition. Uh, I think you just auditioned. No, I never audition. I get offered. For, no, for the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders. I've been decimated because I'm Palestinian. So now I'm not teaching anywhere. I don't have any shows coming up. I don't have any money. But I have the cutest cats in the world, and I can live with myself. I'm hungry, but I can live with myself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Well, is this one of the most chaotic interviews you've ever had? <laughs> it's the it's the best. It's one of the best ever, ever, ever. You know, we want to speaking of hope in the arts and you know, next generations and and maybe and and jobs, right? That's the other yeah, thing. So you have a new book. It's a it's a graphic novel, Shiny Misfits. And for us OGs, it's a comic book, okay? This graphic novel business, it's a comic yeah, book. Yes. My brother's a, a a a colorist for Marvel, so I'm you know I I I love I love comic books. Has he seen Shiny Misfits? I don't know if he has, but he's going to. He's definitely he going to send it to him because color was such a huge part of that book. I I definitely am going to show it to him. I'm going to I'm going to give it to him. And, you know, in yours, it centered a disabled brown girl named Bay Ann. And there are no borders and no nations in your story. Um, it's available in print by Scholastic. This is the promo part. And uh, via audio on Audible. And we hope you can tell us about the book, the best way to order. And especially for our audience, the best way for teachers and librarians and homeschoolers to maybe order in bulk. Because we have quite a few of those folks. Best way to order by far is just by going to scholastic.com because there's no person in between. And so teachers have a button on Scholastic's website where they're like, I'm a teacher. Here's my, you know, what I want to order. Libraries can put in like their library information. And then regular buyers can buy the book directly from Scholastic. And of course, if you have little ones, or you're a teacher or you work in schools, we're gonna be in all the book fairs in October. And I have to tell you, Scholastic has been so incredibly supportive because Good. my book came out six months into the genocide um, and after the horrors of October 7th. And it, it, they could have buried it so easily. And they supported me and they believed in me and they defended me and they amplified me. And the book is in so many different hands. And um, I want to tell you a little bit about Shiny Misfits. Yes, so, yes. I'm an old school comic book fan. It's a comic book. It's written like a comic book. 
people who are annoyed by like there being too many talking bubbles never actually read comic books and and um we're getting killed on goodreads and so i i laugh a lot about shiny misfits because kids who read the book love it and parents are so annoyed and the thing that annoys parents the most is that we don't explain the cerebral palsy. And so their kids have questions about this disability. And the reason I didn't explain, I don't even mention that Bayan has cerebral palsy until page 50. But my incredible illustrator, Shadia Amin, made sure the cerebral palsy was apparent in every panel. So either her hands are shaking or her mouth is crazy or her legs are like buckled, but you always can tell that she's palsy. And she gets more shaky as her mood changes and so on and, and so forth. And the reason I didn't mention the disability till the 50th page was I wanted kids to identify. Maybe you don't have a disability and you twitch all the time because you're an anxious kid. Maybe you have polio and that's what it looks like in you. Maybe you have MS and that's what it looks like in, in you, I wanted kids to be able to identify with Bayan, her best friend, Michelle, who is, you know, living in poverty, her best friend, Davy, who I made kind of this multi-ethnic baked clay could be anyone you want to identify with misfit, because I wanted kids to be able to define things themselves. But mm -hmm. the idea that 10 year olds walk around saying, I have cerebral palsy, it means I shake all the time. Other people with cerebral palsy use wheelchairs. Some are nonverbal. My brain is damaged, but I am brave. That's not how kids work. And mm -hmm. so like, I'm getting like eaten alive in the reviews by people who are like, she didn't explain the cerebral palsy. Why didn't the 10 year old just go up to her crush and say, hey, you exploited me on social media and that made me feel bad. I was like, she can't even talk to her 10 year old crush. You want her to explain the economics of the exploitation of disability and inspiration porn <laughs> in the first 10 pages of a comic book that I put 148 like Easter eggs for parents my age to find from like Goonies quotes to the outsiders to like obscure Jersey Shore references, you know, <laughs> and you want this kid to explain cerebral palsy, but then, you know, and so like, I look at these ratings and I think these people don't understand that they are also affecting people's livelihoods. That this book is so important for disabled kids to have this really normal kid who does really, makes really bad decisions and like has to learn really hard lessons as a disabled role model, as a powerful disabled role model. And instead they're like, she made a joke about the cat eating pancakes and pan cats going into sugar shock is not funny. So I'm giving this book one star. And I'm like, now I can't be listed in the library recommendations. You know what I mean? Like yeah. people don't understand that not everything is a comment section, that things like good reads affect, you know, people's livelihood. But I want to talk about not having borders because that was another funny complaint. Palestinians got mad at me too because they were like, she doesn't talk about Palestine. And I'm like, there's no borders. There's no borders in this world. But there was diversity in race. And that's why it was so important for the colorists to understand. Bayan's parents reflect my parents. So the mom is porcelain white. The dad, we say, is desert sand. The daughter is rose gold. And the reason that we used elements was I consulted with First Beautiful. Nation women. And I asked the First Nation women, before there were borders, how did we describe skin tones? And they told me we used elements. And so I used wood and metal and sand and clay to describe these characters to kind of remind people that diversity is gorgeous. It's stunning. We don't erase diversity when we give people equality, we embrace it. But it's a silly, silly book with a lot of jokes in it. And uh, yeah, if you don't like funny things, you won't like it. Um, but if you don't like funny things, you might still love the pictures. 
Because Shadia, I mean, my Colombian, Palestinian, Lebanese artist, mother of Danny DeVito and Pixel, the dog and cat, um, is just such an incredible illustrator. She's magic. And, and I remember getting the first set of drawings and having two notes, like literally two notes. And one of them was like, Bayan doesn't have a cell phone. It's a big deal. Get the cell phone out. And like, she drew exactly what I imagined. She studied all the material I gave her. And then in colors, jewel tones were really important to us because like, I'm Palestinian. We don't wear beige and brown. We wear red and green and yellow and orange. And so I wanted all those cultural colors to come out and, and have that world be vibrant and reflect the world that I lived in and, and breathed in and, and just kind of inspire kids to be different, to be okay with not being the most popular kid, to stop and realize that they're being mean sometimes. And, you know, to just laugh, laugh at yourself, laugh at your friends, fail, get up again, fail again. But the audiobook has something really special. And that's my friend Dave Matthews voices Lucy the cat in the book. So Bayan's cat talks, but <laughs> It only talks to her. <laughs> so we don't know if the cat is Bayan's in a monologue, if it's magical, if it's like drop dead friend and an imaginary friend. But we do know that Lucy the cat is voiced by rock star Dave Matthews. Because when I wrote the cat, I wrote her as a rhyming cat and I wrote her for Dave. But then I named one of the other characters Davy Matt. So everyone was like, that's Dave Matthews. I'm like, no, no, he's the cat. He's so you've cat. got the audio book on Audible, the print book, sit down, look at the pictures, have me and Dave Matthews read to you uh, and, and make this a cult favorite so that I can have so much more money than um, Turf J.K. Rowling. I can take her crown and wear it in dignity, respect, and without hate, and be inclusive instead of um, funding someone who in, it really invokes violence against women and that whole community. Yes, yes. We're on it. We're on it. You hear every cow? You see how I'm using J.K. Rowling being garbage to promote shiny misfits? Yeah. To get my own, have my own podcast. <laughs> That, that's the best use of placement I've seen yet. Excellent. <laughs> and, hey, we're on it. And and so everybody watching this, because, you know, it, it will be on, um, uh, they, on, it'll be September 15th, but it will remain on. So for everyone watching, we're on it. The campaign to make shiny misfits uh, just go go wild. It's going to go wild. Shinymisfits.com. 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 It'll tell you all about the book. It'll show you where to order the audio book. It'll let you look up if there's a nice indie bookstore in your neighborhood. That's also important. Amazing, which is amazing to like support a really nice little local bookstore that might be carrying it. You could ask your local bookstore to order it for you. And you can also ask your library to order it for you. They might already have copies that you can either take out or put on hold. Uh, but if they don't, you can say, hey, I'd love you to have this title. Your website is maysoon.com, M-A-Y-S-O-O-N.com. And we'll put all these links at the bottom. I got my own name. It was because I was an egomaniacal teen when the websites were created and nobody knew what it was. And I was like, oh my God, I'm totally buying my name. And my name is two English words that mean something together. May soon. You may soon move. You may soon get married. Like, it's a valuable website. It'll be the last thing I sell. Well, no, it'll be the second to last thing I sell. The cats will be last. <laughs> you you may soon have a free Palestine. And we have to make sure of that. Uh, inshallah. Yeah, inshallah. Inshallah. You soon have a free Puerto Rico. Yes. Also. Inshallah. Inshallah. Yes. I'll give you the free America because right now our right to speech, right to protest, right to life is not yeah. free. Free really the US. Free, free yeah. the US. Free the US. Free the US. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> May soon, May soon, we love you. We love we you. Thank you. And we're on the campaign for Shiny Misfits. We're we're, we're on your you. side. We're on your team. Love you. Love you, two you. Are you two are Shiny Misfits. Yes, yes oh, we yes. are. So, <laughs> so misfit. Yes. Love to you and your family. And, and your family. family. Love you. And may they all be protected. Inshallah.